All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome back to the show. And uh, I'm very thankful for this show because it keeps me on track in what otherwise would be a rudderless world when I wouldn't know what to do or what's going on in my chess life. And um, just to recap, um, in this COVID time, without any games to play, uh, at least not over the board games, I started uh, reading various books. One of those was re trying to reread, actually, as I covered a couple uh, episodes back, um, Korshnoi's Practical Rook End Games, probably the hardest book I've ever read. And it turned me on to this idea that, hey, there's all these Rook End Games that I have played myself, and kind of like the Korshnoi Rook End Games, there's all kinds of magic underneath the surface that I wasn't uh, fully aware of and that I needed to go back and take a look at some of these games. And the idea with the Practical Rook Game Games book with Korshnoi is instead of like doing a full game, just do the end game. Now, so in the back of my mind, I had this game I played with Yermo in the 2010 U.S. Championship Primarily, I think the memory stuck with me because in the post-mortem, Yermo gave me a little smirk as if to suggest I did not understand Rook endings. And it is certainly true that Yermo is one of the best endgame players, at least in the United States. And so that stuck with me. And even though I've studied a lot of endgames myself, uh, I'm sure he's a better endgame player. I have, and then I realized, like, I've had several endings with Yermo that are pretty interesting, this being one of them. So I covered the beginning of this game uh, in the last episode, and now it's going to get pretty hot and hectic with this ending here. Now, um, let me just say, I have spent days and days on this, and it might be boring just to everybody involved, but I want to stress this show is a selfish show. It is just about me and my own attempt to get better. I do other shows that are meant for other people. This show is meant for me, but it also keeps me on track, and I hope other people kind of get something out of it. And I will say, in terms of stuff that I have done, chess work I have done, studying this ending, I feel like just opened up new worlds for me about what chess is and like the possibilities of the game. So let me explain what I am going to attempt to do here. Uh, the gnomes at chess.com said, Cry, you want an extra little bit of time on the chess TV? That's fine. You can have some extra time on the chess TV. So um, what I'm going to do is do a little bit extra today. And um, so I'm going to try a little extra as in more time than use my usual like hour. And I'm going to try to do is go through the variations that I thought were the most essential with my, let's call it human analysis, right? And what I do know from studying Korshnoi's book and Nikitin's book is that when you do analysis without the computer, there will be mistakes. And I think that's one of the interesting things about that kind of analysis. Uh, as part of uh, my own game analysis, though, of course, I'm going to turn on the computer at the end. And I feel like a lot of the wisdom, I'm hopefully that I won't lose the wisdom that I gain from a human perspective when I do turn the computer on. In any case, that is to say, at the end of this show, I'm going to check some of the main lines uh, with the computer, and several people might call my BS on the show. They might say, cry, no way, buddy, that variation is wrong, and the computer is going to show you why. Um, and one thing I want to stress, this is not only for people watching, but also for myself, is that... Uh, you know, I preach a good game about studying your own games as the key to improvement. This particular tournament, 2010, I studied reasonably well ahead of it, but then, 2010 U.S. Championship, but then afterward, 
um, I just, like, other things were happening in my life. So I, like, reviewed the game a little bit with Yermo after, you know, as you do in the postmortem. But other than that, this has laid dormant for 10 years. And it was only in the back of my mind when I was thinking about Korshnoi that I thought this game, uh, this position would be really interesting. And I had just remembered the Rook M game. That was the only thing I really remembered that I had blown it. In any case, so long story, let's get into it. Um, the first question that the computer and others will kind of maybe uh, contradict me on is I felt in this position, just from an intuitive standpoint first, that white was some kind of better and my intuition was clearly better. We're gonna see that that's probably my guess is through all the analysis, it's probably closer to slightly better. But I want to say I gave this position, uh, I had a, we had a session on Chess Dojo. And um, I, it was, I did like, uh, we did this cool thing where Kostya gave people calculation exercises. And then I gave them, let's call it evaluation exercise or intuitive exercises. So you were allowed to look at this position for a little bit more than a minute and just come up with a basic judgment of about what you think is going on. And for the most part, people said that black was better. And um, the reason it is, so already it's really interesting that people could think that it's black was better and maybe I'm saying it's something like white is clearly better. And these were reasonable players and it would not surprise me if the computer gets turned on and the computer says, no, dude, you're totally wrong. Black is, in fact, better. So uh, let's just talk uh, basics before we get into the nitty gritty of all the analysis. Um, as I mentioned last time, this is a paradigmatic position for the Fisher ending with bishop and rook against rook and knight. And the idea, of course, is the bishop controls more squares. Um, and the bishop is a longer range instrument. So, for example, it can do all kinds of things and then still come back and catch the f pawn over here. Um, so, um, that's the reasoning to think that white's better. And also, maybe you could say that white's king is better. I think one of the things we'll see in the variations, though, is that in fact uh, the king can come under some really annoying counterplay. And so, as I said, this is one of the hottest positions I've ever... You know, it's funny to say that. I was going to say it was one of the hottest positions I've ever looked at. In fact, I think almost every chess position is really hot, and you just need to get inside of it to understand that it is hot. Um, and if you don't get inside of it, chess will just seem kind of boring and dull. And I think every chess player, including myself, has gone through some period in their life when they're like, oh, chess is not that interesting of a game. There's not that much going on. It's all figured out or something like that. And obviously wrong, but it's it, you get to some point that it just feels dull and it's not so interesting anymore. That's when you're going to come to that kind of absurdist uh, claim. Right? Okay. So, now, big decision for Yermo here, and let's put it in a practical context before we get to, like, the objective variations or whatever you want to call it. We're in the 30s, uh, so we get a little bit more time at move 40. Both sides have tanked a little bit already. And fortunately, do not have the full, like, game score with the times anymore, I have to have the moves, but I have a vague recollection that both of us, you know, didn't have forever to think about these coming decisions here. And, and you know, now it's even worse with the end game. You just have less and less time. Um, and so part of the deal with analyzing this really in depth is to get a sense of how endings work in a clear more clear way, in the same way when you study complex middle games, that you get a sense of some of the dynamics at play. Even So even if you don't have that much time on the clock, you can have a better chance of under you know making some good moves, or at least a series of good moves. 
Okay, so um, black played rook takes d1, and my first uh, reaction was that that was a mistake. Uh, it turns out it's still pretty complicated. And so let's first look at what I thought was the better move. Okay, so rook b8, and now... Um, I mean, I spent days on this position, so of course I looked at things like rook f1. Let me just introduce the basic idea. When he plays rook d1, he gives me the d file and becomes passive. So with rook b8, he's holding the d file, and something I'm guessing he didn't appreciate, just also the way he played later, and I don't think I really felt it either, was how much play black can generate with b4 and b3 and the knight doing tricky dances all over me uh, and that let's call it uh, intuition was all about the fact that my king is in some ways should be an extra piece on the queen side but of course if his pieces start attacking me like if you imagine if he gets in b4 b3 my king doesn't have any great spots because like king c3 is mountains of trouble with moves like knight a4. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that e5 is the right move. And now um, for days, I thought that f3 was the move where black could uh, fight. And so um, let's go down that road first. And... Um, Let's say that B4 then later uh, occurred to me as maybe even more intense. And that was because later I started seeing ideas with B4 and then I was like, oh, well, maybe we should start considering it like pronto. Let's do F3 first. So F3, and I tried loads of things here. Rook, F1, E6, the whole business. The only thing I could come up with was rook d6, f2, and f2 I thought was a stunning move when I first found it. And the idea is pretty, well, I was going to say basic, but it's not that basic. Um, if you take the pawn now, which I think most people would just be terrified of, king h7, that's forced. King g7. And now wherever you go with the rook, the grief is that your pieces are all uh, discoordinated, actually, such as this knight. And if I remember right, both knight d5 and b4 are very strong moves. And for example, rook f2, knight e3, and I'm actually losing. That's mate. And rook d1 is going to be mate too. In fact, I think I even tried this. This is how desperate I was to find a solution. But I'm also getting made it here. For example, snip, snip, b3 is the threat. And if rook a6, there's terrible things happening to me like b3 and rook over, mate. So it's really a terrible business, my friends. <laughs> it's a terrible business. And one of the cool things too, actually from a practical perspective is, and this is one of the reasons it's a macho ending, is that um, for white to play for a win in a lot of these variations, I got to take on what is at least what at least looks like risk, right? <laughs> like this, things could go dramatically wrong in these positions. Hi, Sledgehammer. So, okay, this was all I could find was rook d6, f2, rook e d1, fight for the d file, right? Snip, snip, and now, nota bene, the knight is, as from the beginning, the knight is the problem piece. Okay, so now king g7 I gave is the main line, but b4 is also interesting. Check, rook f6, and I'm not 100% sure what's going on, but I'm, what I said was that white was clearly better here. Not winning, but clearly better in this position. Okay, so king g7, e6, 
e7. Okay, so this was the key idea that I came up with here, um, where rook d8 is the threat, and unfortunately for him, uh, the, the rook can't move. And so there's just a problem there. If b3, which I thought was the best move, king c1, rook e8, rook takes, rook takes, king d2. And again, I wasn't entirely certain what was going on here, but I evaluated it as clearly better for white. So for example, rook e1, rook f6. And I've looked, I looked at everything here, rook b1, rook h1. Uh, rook h1 may be his best shot. Let me show you rook b1 first, this kind of thing. And I'll take, or here I can take with a king or the bishop, and it looks like it is significantly better for white again. Whew, really, really tight. Okay, so um, in addition, of course, he could have done other things. Like rook h1, and then I believe I got to do this kind of business. And again, I only want to say that this is clearly better. I don't want to make claims about it being winning. But it does, yeah, it seems like I'm clearly better in this position. Okay. <laughs> really, uh, really exciting. Now, the thing with the macho, it's funny. I started as a joke, but... Uh, what I find is like when people have been playing for several hours and they've already missed, they know they've made mistakes. They're exhausted um, and they're feeling kind of fragile. It is very natural not to uh, be courageous or in the words of like a 1950s movie character to like man up or whatever, you know, whatever manly virtue word you want to use. Um, and so it's the intuition is oftentimes just like, okay, I just want to end the drama and I, I can't, you know, I can't fight anymore. And Yermo, interestingly, I think not only is his end game skills like really strong, but he's an example of a guy who for years was dominating the Swisses in the United States by taking people out in the end game. Every single time there'd be some 2400 dude who would get through his opening theory or whatever, and then Hermo was come and sit on him, and then it's all over. So he's my example, actually, of what it looks like, what it feels like to do the macho ending. Because, right, it takes, takes a whole nother level. Okay, so, where are we here? Uh, F3... The computer, by the way, is going to say I'm totally wrong. I'm okay with that. King g7 and uh, e6. Uh, here I looked at king f8, but then rook d2. And then e7. Really brutal. So this is one of the key variations I'll have to check. I thought this was a fascinating uh, geometry lesson here with e7 and the rook can't move and the knight is dominated. So really exemplifying a lot of the, uh, let's call it traits of how this ending works with the bishop and the rook dominating the knight. Okay, so uh, then I started looking at b4. And the funny thing with b4 was at first it felt like it shouldn't work. Um, but then I just started having all kinds of grief in, in you know, doing something. And so let me just share a couple variations here. Um, let's say I try A, B, A, B, E6. Now, anytime I do E6, this will actually introduce the position a little bit. Anytime I do E6, uh, I'm losing the scope of the bishop on H3. And the weird thing about this E pawn in general even when the rook in, with the rook end game, is if the king just gets in front of it, it's dead. Just a dead, stupid pawn. So uh, looking at this end game, and I couldn't find anything, and I believe just b3, and um, 
yeah, I'm not, I'm not doing it here actually, because he's gonna, I don't know, I can't really go up, and then if this happens to me, something like king f8, and just not clear at all that I've got anything in this position. Okay, maybe the computer will say something otherwise, but let me show you what hours and hours of research probably, the, and the funny thing too, of course, the computer will tell me I'm just ridiculous, but that's okay. Uh, came up with this move I'm very proud of. I came up with a couple moves I was really happy with, and that is b3. And one reason it didn't even occur to me early on is that it didn't seem like, first of all, that I would have any chance of winning the game if I start trading stuff off. But uh, yeah, also I was like, I, I can't lose the initiative uh, myself. But the interesting thing that I love about b3 is really what I'm doing is I'm playing against this knight. And so the knight, I'm, run, I'm running the thing out of squares. If I allow b3, then the knight has all kinds of dancing on me with knight a4 and knight d5 and the rest of it. So this position here I assessed as slightly better for white. We'll give that the, the old check later. But for example, if c3, then I play rook d6. And if he takes the thing, then we're saying that not only is the b4 pawn weak, but more importantly, the knight is dominated. That's the most important thing about the position, as far as I can tell. Okay, so we'll check that later. And go back to the game. Yermo played rook d1, rook d1, and rook c6. Now, I think I just briefly touched on this last week, this position, and uh, in my memory of it, you know, it just seemed partly, you know, you're playing and you kind of trust, you're not worried too much about what your opponent might or might not do the guy's going to give you something and then you have to deal with it and so in my thought process is like from here to the rook ending was kind of forced but no it's actually way more intense than that uh let's mention a side variation rook e8 doesn't seem excuse me rook e8 doesn't seem right because just rook d6 and that kind of gets to what the position's about, right? Because I start winning this stuff, and uh, yeah, that's a good position to think about where <clears throat> either white's clearly better or white's winning because king pawns, split pawns, and the truly a Fisher ending here is going on. So I didn't analyze this out to say that we're necessarily completely winning, but definitely I felt there was a clear advantage. Okay, here we go. Rook c6. e5. And e5, let's say, it's a, there's a lot going on with e5. Um, I am... It's, it's several things. It's Yes, I'm closer to the edge of the board, but I'm also threatening rook d6 at some point, and also bishop g2 becomes an idea. Okay, so again, I thought for, ever, so it, at first it just seems like your most move has got to be correct. And um, certainly the most natural human move. But of course in the post I started thinking about this because I was, you know, I was haunted by all these variations where the guy, you know, starts mating me or something over here on the queen side. And this became very difficult to deal with here. Um, and as an example, let me show rook here, check. And it's kind of hard to know what to do. The best I could come up with was here, check to the miserable king. And uh, king c3, knight a4 is a disaster. On king d2, terrible things happened to me as well with like c3, knight c4. And so for a while I said king c1, c3, 
takes c2, and as far as I can tell, I'm the one losing here because rook d6 and rook d1 is very difficult to deal with. Okay, maybe I can get a draw with going back and forth here, but the, <laughs> that's not what I was interested in. I, even that might be lost for me. In any case, you know, once I saw that I couldn't win, I had to abandon this variation. And one of the interesting things, too, about the analysis, especially doing without the computer, is honestly, you're like in a real game, there's no grounding. There's no like, oh, you know, you're better here. I don't know. Like I said at the beginning of the position, the computer might say that black is better. I have no idea what the thing is going to say. I have no idea at all. Okay, so here's my controversial claim. That after looking at it forever, I think that actually rook d6 is really annoying. Uh, and one thing is, I wanted to make it work even better with bishop g2, rook e6, rook d6. But the weird thing is I couldn't figure out rook e5, where he's got this threat on me. So, uh, rook d6, and it just seems dumb at first, because you're like, okay, he takes... And you say, right, I get it, you're threatening d7, but king f7. And then look at this simple move, bishop g2. Um, it, this, this I found really stunning, because white is down a pawn. Black has got these pawns that look like past pawns to me. And um, the incredible thing that white's saying is he's saying the bishop is dominating the pieces anyway, and in particular, if you go win this pawn, it's, it's actually, uh, I guess, lost or something because these pawns are, are maniacs over here. They're total maniacs. And so when you go back to this position, uh, I couldn't find a way for white or for black to equalize. And... For example, he can uh, sit in a variety of ways. For example, king e6, bishop e4, king f7. But here I was thinking, like, I don't know exactly where to move, but if I just move somewhere like king c1, I don't know what he's supposed to do, you know. I don't know what he's supposed to do. It's getting kind of difficult. For example, king g7, he's got to worry about bishop d5. Or bishop c6, maybe both those moves are pretty frightening. So, uh, right. <laughs> really amazing stuff. Uh, is it winning? I don't know. For the most part in my analysis, I was just content that I was able to prove uh, that white could continue the push, as it were. And this very much surprised me. I... I looked at this position a long time before I came to understand that maybe I've got a little something, something here. What trading the rooks? Because original, and it's very counterintuitive too, because the rook is so passive on c6. But the problem always was that the guy was giving me grief. He's threatening like b3 and stuff right away. Okay. So. All right, let's go to the game. King f7, rook d4, king e7, rook f4. Okay, now Yermo makes what has to be a mistake. It's got to be a losing mistake. Uh, and like I said before, at the time I felt like um, it was somehow forced or something. Totally not forced. Um, it feels that way because it feels like white truly now has gotten his dreams. You know, I don't have to deal with the pesky f pawn anymore. My bishop's much better. But what needs to be seen is that his queenside pawns are still actually very dynamic. And it was definitely worth it for... Uh, black to get his king on the blockading square. One interesting thing I've come up with as a rule of thumb is I've noticed that 
one of the reasons people have a hard time learning rook endings or end games maybe in general is that they don't understand what activity means and for black it's definitely being somewhere in the blockade range here with e on the, having the king on e7 or e8 so having in you know he gave me the pawn but for that he invested his king to get over there and i i want to stress that dogmatic thing because uh, we're going to see that the e pawn he's not that impressive of a dude you know he's not the most impressive dude okay I see. Don't give me the machine yet. We're gonna do. Uh, we're gonna do the machine in a little in a little bit. I promise. We're gonna bring up the machine. Okay. So, um, knight d seven was played. I thought after long analysis that knight d five. At first, I thought actually white had nothing here, and because amazingly after rook d four. By the way, this position you can imagine Yermo definitely considered, but then it just seems like, okay, where does the knight go? And indeed, if you do something like this, then at the very least, white's clearly better. Uh, the thing, though, that stumped me forever was rook c5. And the bummer is that the knight on d5 is very tricky. For example, I can't move the bishop because of knight e3 stuff. And so I looked forever at this thing. And for the longest time, I didn't even find anything at all. And I was like, can I even, I was like, am I worse? You know, and I started considering weird, like desperation things like this variation, which is cute, but it just can't be right. <laughs> it's just like, it's probably, it's probably not gonna work right. And uh, there's probably more than one way for black to win this, but I came up with this nasty thing and uh, at the very least, he's winning this race here. You know, and then we got this, and then all I know is I'm not winning this thing. <laughs> Maybe I'm holding this, but I'm not winning it. Okay, so that was like to, to have considered that for white. This shows like how desperate I was for trying to find some kind of plan. And uh, for example, Bishop G2, I thought about, could I reach this ending? Like multiple times, I was so desperate, I looked at that move, even though I had already seen that knight E3 just ends the game for me. That's how desperate I was. Because it was really frustrating. It's like, really? This rook C5 is so devastating here. And then I found a move that I was very happy with, which was king c1. <laughs> I was really like, what? What's going on here? And the idea, I, I really like it because the idea is that if I can just reroute the stupid bishop to e4, then I'm going to be at least a little bit better. And black doesn't have any great shakes of moves because if he moves the knight, I've got rook d7. So I looked at uh, b4, bishop g2, knight e3, bishop e4. And it'll be interesting to see what the machine says, but let me just say from a practical perspective, I assess this as slightly better for white and definitely an example where the bishop is much better than the stupid knight because, I mean, I'm just, I'm just doing so many things with that bishop. Okay, so really happy with that one. Uh, doesn't the e-pawn at least give black something to worry about? Yeah, there are a lot of positions where um, where white is, the the e-pawn gives something to worry about, but the, <laughs> we're going to see some nasty ones too. But in general, right, the e-pawn is not the main problem for black if the king is already on e7. Okay, so sledgehammer, knight d5, I think we're talking about the same position. Um, right, so let's move on now. Oh, before we move it down to the game, in this position, besides knight d5, I, th I thought for a moment maybe b4 would work, but here rook f6 
this is maybe instructive where now when we get this position this is just a much better version and uh, maybe I have something better than rook f6 but to me it was just uh, you know one of these things where it suffice to say I'm doing much better where if the knight moves I've got bishop d5 and uh, I'm going to play bishop e4 soon plus it's kind of a weird thing with this b4 move is that uh, it does weaken this pawn and I think honestly uh, there was probably something in the back of Yermo's mind where he did not want to play uh, b4 at any point Okay, so here we go. Uh, rook f4, knight d7. Bishop takes, king takes, king c3. And um, friends, <laughs> friends, I did not win this game. To me, it's obvious looking at it now that it has to be winning for white. Um, the mistakes I make to not win this game are pretty subtle in nature and maybe more interesting is that Yermo creates practical difficulties for me in in the coming positions and um, I think for example like when you think about endgame skill and you think about someone like Yermo it is uh, his skill level in terms of um, you know playing this kind of position, which is trying to give white some kind of grief. Really impressive. Okay, so he plays king e7, and we'll see. It looks like a weird move, but we'll see the point, and I'll show you. Well, let me show you how it goes, and I can show you it kind of is going to end up in the same thing, as far as I can tell. So rook f6, rook c5, exclam. It looks weird, but the point of rook c5 is that when I come up, he goes back, and now he has a threat of b4. Okay. So, uh, what I wanted to show first is, like, if he comes here first, it's very similar. Because I think he's got to come up, and then we're just transposing like this to, you know, the, uh, to the game. Okay, so king e7, rook f6, rook c5, King d4, rook c8. So now this is the th move 39. And uh, this is the move I think that Yermo uh, felt like I didn't understand for games. <laughs> and maybe it's true. I don't know what he, you know, I, I don't know exactly what he saw, but the point is that, that where the critique is that I went after the pawns. We're going to see I go after the pawns and... I think I was fundamentally, my intuition was correct that I was winning that position too, but it's not so easy. Not, it's not so easy here either though, so it's a kind of tricky situation and definitely the move I did, not only am I pawn grubbing, but I am doing a thing where I am like completely denying counterplay or making sure that I can't lose, if you will which I don't know how I'm going to lose this position anyway. <laughs> but anyways, I played rook b6, and I think I'm still winning after rook b6. But let me show you what I think is a simple way for uh, black for white to win. We'll check it later. Uh, rook g6, b4. Now, the guy could also check me, but what I, what I think is the end there is then I just play rook b6 and... Uh, I'm getting everything. So, uh, rook g6, b4, and the move you gotta gotta see, I think, in this position. Machine, again, will probably say there's a thousand different moves, or maybe he'll say black's already okay, I have no idea. But I gotta play rook b6 immediately, I think. And the point is that, obviously I'm threatening the pawn, that c3 is the only thing scary, takes and if ba i'm just going to go rook b1 and if bc again i play rook b1 and the big point of this is going to be that because i left the a pawns on 
uh, you know, I'm going to win this pawn. He's going to, his king's going to go do some fancy stuff itself, of course. I'm going to win that pawn, and then my king is going to go after the A pawn. So, this position, I didn't do too much in terms of variations, but once I saw this, I said to myself, this has just got to be winning. Um, and he'll, he'll win the E pawn, for example. The, it's going to be hard, though. It's going to be very hard. I got the G pawn and the A pawn, and both of them are going to roll. So we'll check that again. But that was, to me, the key variation with rook B6 x glam that I needed to see, I think, to play uh, this variation. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to see. I did the pawn grubber, failing my own rule that pawns aren't people. Rook D8. King c5, rook d2, rook b5. Okay, so clearly this was the position I saw in my mind. And I saw that the pawn on c4 is falling. The pawn on a5 looks like it's falling. And what I'm sure really got to me in terms of my intuition was that I, since I saw that both of these were going to fall, that the power of the connected passers would be too much for black to deal with. Okay, so first of all, Yermo plays another good move, king e6. Um, if rook h2, then king d5, and it's just totally over because rook b7, and good night. So king e6, king c4, rook h2. Okay, so... Um, Really, there's a really intense analysis here. Um, I initially gave my next move, which is rook a5, a question mark. And I think I still want to give it a question mark. But I think I'm still winning after the move in the game with rook takes a5. The move I spent uh, some time on that, I th that makes more intuitive sense to me in how to, terms of how to win this is... Rook b6, king e5. Now, uh, king f5, we're going to come back to. King b5, rook h4. There is a threat. Black wants to play a4 and shut down my pawns. So I got to take it. King f5, b4. King g5, b5. And this I consider to be like a key position here. And... Of course, like you're playing a game, the only thing you're going to say to yourself is that white is ahead in the race. Um, and I think it'd be very hard to try to calculate it out in a real game. But what's nice about just thinking about this is, you know, imagine I'm in some kind of actual game and I just see that I'm ahead in the race. Then you say, well, it's probably going to be winning. Now, it's still pretty intense. Rook h1, I think is his best try. Rook b8, h4, b6, h3, rook h8, h2. And here, white really needs to find, white needs to be careful. <laughs> Let me put it that way. There was this amazing trick I found where the natural b7, rook b1, king a6, and now a real upset here, rook here. Amazing. So that, uh, if queen, here, 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 king f4, rook takes, g5, draw. Pawn's going to, you know, that rook will have to sacrifice itself. Okay, so the key is, in this position, you got to play a4, x clan. King g4, b7, rook b1, king a6, king g3, a5, king g2, king a7, and now we're just faster. And not only that, but the true bummer for black is that if that were an h-pawn or an f-pawn, then we know that, that this would in fact be a draw. But because it's a sad g-pawn, endgame theory says winning. Okay, so I thought that was amazing. And then I said to myself, wait a second. Maybe the guy can play king f5. 
with the thought that the Ipon is just a tourist and it's close. So here we go. Rook takes, got in the same way I got to take the pawn, right? He snips. And really, like when you think about that variation, I think the way to think about it is to say, right, it's going to be the same thing, except uh, will black have to lose a tempo to deal with the e pawn? And I guess the answer is yes, he does. So for example, I tried on all these variations. I tried rook f4. I tried all kinds of weird things for black. a4, simple and strong. And now, since king f4 would be met by king e6, you got to go king f5. It's really not where you want it to be. Right? Rook b1, king a6, and we're just winning. We're going to take the h pawn next. Mm. Okay. So. The final question really is, am I still winning after rook a5? Rook takes. King c5, rook e4, exclam move from Yermo. He played I want to say he played three exclams on me. Not to say that like even the valuation dramatically changed, but just that he made my job much harder. And ultimately, I think that's how he pulled this off. So king f5, good move. I think what I did is correct. I gain a tempo on the rook. I hold the e pawn. I'm sure I still felt at this point that I was completely winning. And I think it's true. It's just really complicated. OK. So um, Gotham Chess, nice. Thank you, Gotham Chess. We're looking at this game I played with Yermo. And I just did this really intense analysis, Gotham Chess. And basically, the idea of this show is that I just show what I'm doing with my own chess improvement. And uh, spent days, weeks on this game. Uh, and we're about to finish it up. And then in about a couple minutes, I'm just going to do a reveal on all my human analysis to see like what went, what was the actual truth of the situation. So this is me against Yermo. Yermo correctly plays rook e1. Why? Well, he wants to touch the queening square. All right, here we go. b4, h4. And here I think this is my final uh, hope to uh, win this game. And it's pretty tricky. So, i.e., I've already made it really difficult. I played rook f8. And we'll come back to that miserable move. It's kind of like the natural, let's call it the natural move. You play rook f8 and play rook h8. I'm sure I still thought I was intuitively winning. But if I wanted to win, the last chance was b5, h3, rook f2. And it feels wrong because the king's going to come up. But king g4, e6, king g3, rook b2, snip, snip. And now I think it's important, just my human sense of how this works, to play a4. And the idea is that when he plays g5, I can play b6. And the point is, if he starts checking me, right, I can go run. And whenever he plays rook b1 to mess with me, I can always protect the thing. So my king can hide next to the e pawn. And then he has to deal with both of the pawns running on the queen side. So this was like my last chance to win. And obviously, yeah, in a real game, it's, you, you can have a heart attack. <laughs> Wondering if you're going to pull this thing off here. All right, I played rook f8. And Yermo again just found some nice moves. He checks me to the side. h3, king g4, a4. Rook c4, and it's already pretty clear. Maybe it dawned on me here, and I was like, no, dude. It's not working anymore, and I actually offered a draw after b5. So things went dramatically wrong. Really, um, yeah, I want to thank the Practical Rook Endgames by Korshnoi as being the main driver for me to understand. They give me the inspiration to come into this game with an understanding of like what needs to be analyzed and how should it look. Okay, so as promised, we're now going to refute, let's say, 
a lot, I'm sure, a lot of what I did was wrong. And one of the things about the analysis that I want to stress is, to me, the most important things is, by all means, like the human, what, what happened on a human level. What was the human analysis? What kind of rules or memories are you trying to gain from it? And the computer is obviously going to tell me some other stuff. So, Bishop H3. Let's start here. If you guys have a line, if you're watching and you want to ask me, I think IC had some questions about uh, per specific positions. We can totally get into it. I'm interested what the comp says here. Here we go. And great. He's actually, he changed his mind a little bit, but now he's saying, he's saying black is better. So, so I was apparently wrong. Let's see. Maybe he can change his mind here. So rook b8, that's what he likes. E5, and now it's saying, honestly, everything's better for black. It's changing its mind. It's changing its mind. It wants a uh, king. That's what wanted some weird stuff, honestly. Let's just see what it wants here. King F8, rook D6. That was certainly my intention. Knight D5. Okay, there's an example of a totally bizarre... Uh, move that I didn't even think about. Rook g6. And now it's saying he's equal after knight e3, maybe better after b4. <laughs> totally hilarious. Well, it's changing its mind, but now it's, it's just saying equal. So let's say knight e3, king c1, rook d4. Really fascinating. So, for example, rook f6, king g7. Right, it's laughing at the e-pawn, basically. And I guess I have to also worry about rook d8. That's the big thing that I have to worry about with this rook d4 move. All right, so let's review. The computer immediately found something obvious. King, or excuse me. King f8, did I even consider this move? No, I didn't. Rook d6, knight d5. Rook g6, knight e3. If king c3, we have the known waiting pattern, rook d3. King c1, rook d4. And so, very simple computer idea, he wants to mate me. So he's saying here, and he's saying I got to do this thing. And now it's saying it's actually equal. Right? Totally bizarre thing to say. Uh, you know. So the idea, of course, was bishop c2, and now rook here, rook here. Oh my god, this is a total mess. Yeah, total mess. And it's saying equal. Oh my God. Well, <laughs> woo. Yeah. Uh, do I consult table bases? Um, you know, at some point I might. I feel like this position here. Uh, I just wanted to see what basic stuff I was missing. And already there, like there's, I knew there was I mean, a very rich position. And the funny question is, should I revise my human sentiment that black, that white is better? You know, I look, cause I looked at it for days and after rook b8, I thought I found a small advantage for white. Did I, I didn't even consider the variation that the computer said, right? I didn't even consider it. Okay. Let's go to another position here. So here, here, rook c6, and I'll turn the beast on. Um, all right, it likes my move, but it also thinks that black is better. <laughs> um, that's hilarious. So e5, let's look at what happened. King f7, 
Rook d4, this is the game. King e7. Rook f4. And at the, I guess at the least it says that this position that I was looking at forever, it's saying that black is better. It does say my move with king c1. So to recap, this was the double x glam move that I found that at least gave me what I thought was a slightly better position here. Let's look. He does give b4 as the main move. I snip. He snips. This is totally what we had earlier. Earlier, I had this on my own analysis. And then bishop e4. And it's saying a move I did not consider at all. Knight f5. I have to admit, I didn't consider that one. Huh. And it's saying black's better. I was so proud of my king c1 move. Um, g6. Not, I mean, it's pretty. Look at this. And this, if I had rook, if rook c4 wasn't check, I would be winning this thing, or at least fine. Even this, totally, totally whacked out. Well, it's now saying it's kind of equalish, but I'll say this I, I didn't miss that. It's saying it's now equal. Um, <laughs> I thought King, I see, I thought King C1 was amazing. Anyways, uh, this computer is now saying that that position is in fact equal. Now, that one, I did say that we were just like going to be a little bit better. And so maybe the takeaway is I still like this King C1. Like from a practical perspective, I'd rather be white. It is true though, if you're black, you're going to find the Knight F5 move. You know, you just not you're not going to want to be messed with. Okay, so um, let's look. Rook f four, and now, uh, dude, definitely blew it. The computer, I guess, the computer's on my page here. Is not even considering knight d seven. Papega, here's the thing with my, we got a question about the computer depth. I'm not a computer expert, and what I'm doing here is I'm doing something I think computer experts find appalling, is that I'm running just the chess.com thing. Uh, last time I did it with my chess-based computer, and running all the stuff with streaming, it started to kind of blow up on me. Plus, it was just like I had two boards. It was too complicated. So when I do my own analysis after this, I'll put it together. I'm going to put a file. This computer, this, excuse me, this video will go on YouTube and I will have like the corrected, the, let's say my, the deep computer analysis there. I just wanted to publicly humiliate myself with this kind of situation here. Um, Let's look for a moment at this b4, because it's not even considering it. Right, no. And then and then we did have this. This is... It's saying it wants ef, I want a gf. But okay, it's very similar evaluation. It's saying ef is just absolutely crushing. And then you go something like that. Fair enough? Like, okay, what is... And he's doing like some kind of deep zoop swung thing here. Okay. Got to be. I I I I was gonna say clearly better for white with the GF. This I guess is stronger now. Clearly winning. Okay, so now on to the macho rook endgame. Hmm. I do need to change the title. Thank you, static. Thank you, static. Let's change that title. Um. I had so many things to do. And I need to change. The, oh, the title's all wrong here. Here we go. I'm going to call it Macho Chess. All right. Got the Macho Chess here. Um, there we go. So, done. Computer says, yes, Jesse, you're winning after Bishop D7. It says, yes, Jesse, you're right with King C3. King e7 is given. Rook f6 is given. Rook c5 exclam is given. 
King d4 is given. Rook c8. All right, we'll give it a moment here to think about uh, my decision. So, again, I played Rook b6. Yermo gave me a smirk. In my analysis, it was still winning. Uh, and it likes, at the moment, it likes Rook b6 more. Um, but it ha does have a different idea. Let's see. Let's just see what the guy's idea is. By the way, it is saying this variation. It does like this rook b6. But, you know, it's not. it doesn't give it as completely winning. Let's just go through this a second. It does say this. It does say this. It does say this. I felt like this had to be winning. King d3. I did look at that. Like rook c5 or something. I don't, I don't know sure if I go. Let's just do his move. King e5, rook c2, rook d8. It's only saying one point something to me. I think I understand what the problem is, though. I want to play king c4, and then it's saying rook d4. Okay. <laughs> I, I didn't see that. And if I play king c3, it's doing things I don't even understand. Uh, rook c8 with the point that if king b3, I assume a4, even here I feel like this is winning. It gives me a check. It's true, it's annoying. And then like king d4. It's, so even here, no, <laughs> this is important. Even here, this is where the computer I really feel is helpful. Like, it's just showing things that missed that my horizon couldn't see in the deep analysis. And do I think that white is still winning here? I, I believe in white, but the computer's just saying it's an advantage. So, kind of fascinating. So, um, all right. I don't know why it says Norm Hunter. I went in there and I thought I changed it to something else, but that's okay. We'll do it. But for today, it's the Norm Hunter. Really cool show, by the way, on Mondays. Uh, Kostya does that with National Master Todd Bryant. Will that guy make it to IM? We'll see. All right, so I played Rook B6. In my notes, I gave it a question mark, but I guess we're saying it's not so bad. Rook D8 was played, and it actually likes King E4. And I got to say, it wasn't even on my agenda but let's see if I can understand. So king e4, maybe I'm getting it. Rook here, rook here. And maybe also this is like where I was materialistic about wanting to win the stupid c3 pawn. So if rook h2, then king d5. Right, I get it, I get it, I get it, oh my god. Okay, very simple. What happened? When I played king c5, rook d2, rook b5, I allowed Yermo this chance with king e6. If I had just played king e4, very simple. The king never gets to go to e6 because I can always knock him away like the punk that he is. Oh man, that was an easy one. That was even easier than the other line. And I, I'm just going to admit it, of all the things that I missed in my analysis, I think that was the most, uh, is the most frustrating. Yeah, in hindsight, it's like one of these things that seems so simple. But I looked forever and forever, and I did not appreciate that. All right, king c5, rook b5, king e6, x land, king c4, rook h2, and now let's give it a moment. As I said, I felt both rook a5 was ultimately winning and rook b6 was ultimately winning. Um, it's saying, let's go through this rook b6 line. It is, that's its top choice here so far. So king e5, king b5. It likes my, it likes my move. All right, rook a5, king a5, king f5, b4. Now it wants rook g4 or rook e4. Okay, rook h1, it's it's a little bit schizophrenic here. <laughs> it's dancing all around with all kinds of moves. Um, 
I thought king g5 was just kind of forced. Let's go ahead and look. This didn't seem right to me, rook g4. b5, rook g5. Yeah, I'm just going to play like rook c6 and you're toast, right? Yeah, now he agrees I'm to he's toast. Okay, good. So I'm happy with that. It looks like rook b6 is indeed winning. Okay, rook h5, a5. I also give a question mark, probably also winning. Rook h4, king c5, rook e4. Yermo played this thing like a machine, man, just like a total machine. Rook a6, king f5. Check, this is all forced according to the machine. Rook e1, okay, so here we go. Ah... Now, here's an interesting thing. The computer wants uh, either b4 or rook f8, so maybe my variation that I thought was the final chance. Rook f2, man. Rook f2. It's right there. Winning. Took the, took the computer a while for it to see it, too. Oh, man. So, uh, rook a5... I hope I understand what you're saying. In any case, rook a5, rook b2 wouldn't work because then the rook gets to, the white rook gets to defend h4. So let's look at this here. b4, h4, and now it still says that my rook f8 is an advantage. Rook f7, to my mind, is the exact same thing as rook f8. All right. Here we go. Uh, rook f2, it's saying, is totally winning, right? The variation that we looked at earlier. So that's at least promising. Now, the question, the final question basically is, did I miss something in the game? Why it's saying rook f7 is different than rook f8, I don't know. I played rook f8. I might go back and check rook f7 if there's some weird difference. This all happened. Check, and I played king b6. Okay, first question. The guy wants me to go to e7, the guy, the computer. Here, here, here. Okay, fascinating. Um... There's, I assume there's some good reason I didn't consider this. Uh, it would have been rook d3, a4, rook d4, and this is what the computer wants, b5, rook a4, e6. Holy majoli. Right, so if you go rook b4, I'm gonna play king d6, rook b5, e7, and I'm gonna have enough, I'm gonna be quick enough to win this thing. h3, rook h8, rook a3, b6, rook b3, king d7, rook b6, e7, or just rook h3 first. Right, I'm winning this thing. This is a known moment. Totally winning. I think. Oh, okay. Computer says maybe not so fast. King f5. Rook f3. If my rook were on f1, it'd be over. King e4. Now it's saying zeros. Zeros, my friend. Zeros. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, Icy's got a contribution earlier, and then we're going to go check it out. Uh, and let's just leave this as a, a footnote we might come back to as well. But I want to ask what Icy's saying earlier, just so I can check it out. So here, here, and... I gave it a question mark because of what Yermo did, which was rook a4, but I believe I see saying rook b2 
is drawing, right? I'd be interested too, like what computer or whatever you're using. Um, I guess I can kind of see how this works. Um, let me just do some human moves. I don't the computer's spitting out all kinds of weird things. So if I play King C3, oh, if I do this, then it checks me to death. If I do that, it checks me to death. Okay, so Rook B2. This is an example too, I think, that if when I get when I do it myself with a with a computer that has a little bit more speed than the chess.com one, I can ask and maybe even with some kind of table-based thing at some point soon, uh, what the evaluation is. But I think I see is right. I don't. I think I don't have it here. Yeah, really fascinating. Wow, this is. And if I was black in this position, I honestly I would assume I was lost. And I guess your mode did too, because your mode took on h four. It's so weird. Like from an objective standpoint, that means that uh, when I, okay, when we got this position here and I wanted to play rook b6, from a human point of view, what I was avoiding was what happened in the game. But what the computer and IC are saying is that, no, the problem with rook a5 is not rook h4, but in fact rook b2, which I assumed right that I was going to get Back in time, let me look at it again. So rook h2, if I go like king c5, and then it does this, it's like, okay, wait, I go king b5, you check me, and let's say I do that. Still seems evil. Rook h2, now my intention was to play rook a4 here. Oh, man. So, I just want to say from a human point of view, I don't necessarily get it. <laughs> I, maybe I, I, I'm kind of coming around to it. But, like, the chess.com computer is like, white's still better, but I get it. It's saying weird things like King C7. Okay, so that was really enlightening. And, like I said, I'm going to put a whole file on this thing uh, in the YouTube video. And I'll have like the correct analysis. I'll probably post the video and then, you know, post the file just so I can take my time with it a little bit later. So that might not be up there immediately. Um, okay, so let me go back and ask this other question with. So I played King B6, and the computer is saying I still have chances with King B6. D6, but I want to try that again, because it did end up saying zeros. By zeros, we mean equal. King E7. Now, Rook D3 was, I'm sure, what I was afraid of. A4, Rook D4, B5, Rook A4, E6. It certainly looks promising. Uh, H3, Rook H8, Rook A3. B6, Rook B3, King D7, Rook B6, oh, and not E7, but rather, this was the variation we had before. Whew, man. Uh, so, I think this is very close, but the computer eventually is saying that I don't have it. Now, what I'm going to do myself is I'm going to look a little bit more intently at these variations and see if there's a way for me to thread the needle. But right now, right, the computer just went full zeros on me. So final question. Did I have any last chances with King B6? Computer says no. Now I've totally lost it. I wouldn't be surprised the computer likes black at the end. Uh, no, the computer's just saying totally equal. Okay, really fascinating analysis. I want to just stress for myself and for anybody who's interested that 
that was maybe the most valuable study I've done, well, at least in a long time, right? Really powerful, mas macho ending, <laughs> the kind of thing where um shows you what it takes uh, to beat a guy like Yermo. The, the guy will find at least, I don't know if you want to call them only moves, but the moves which give White the most grief and the kinds of things that, um, you know, are very difficult to see. Also, you know, the weird thing too with the computer, with this thing that I see saying with Rook takes B2, that's really intense. And I think for Yermo, he was just like, dude, no, I'm going to take the H-pawn and I'm going to run it. And that's why I have play. And this, I'm sh I'm going to guess he didn't even consider because it seems like uh, White keeps the H-pawn and the A-pawn. So then, therefore, <laughs> it's going to be a, it's gonna be lost. But my rook is, in fact, jammed on uh, A5 there. Okay, guys, I'm going to H4, E6 is the win. Okay, um, what? before we go, I see which H4 are we talking about? Maybe in when that final variation, I assume, right? So if we get uh, H4 is already here. So where did H4 happen? H4, but not this H4. We're talking about a different different one the mubot held a um held, held something because of profanity and there was definite profanity <laughs> there was definite profanity for me in this game but it was kind of a joyful profanity i had some good profanity yelling i had a, a, a couple of those moves i found i was really i was really pumped um after h4 e6 is the win as early as possible okay well, I'll take a look at that. And anyways, really enjoyable. Thank you, everybody, for being part, just forcing me to do this myself. I know that without this show, I would just, you know, do, I'd be playing Blitz or something dumb, and I just wouldn't be concentrated. And just having the show, the vague idea that someone is kind of holding me accountable has forced me to uh, do, I think, at least study that's interesting for me. Uh... Next week, I want to make a quick announcement. I might not do the show just because on Wednesday, that is when I do the BigChess.com show. If you want to submit a game, I will review one of your games. I had a hilarious thing where a guy wrote in and said, I didn't understand the opening at all. I got to give up chess <laughs> because of a comment that I made on one of the games. So I definitely will make mistakes. I'm just giving you my opinion as I see it on the games. And on chess.com, you search me under the forums, you'll find it. Um, yeah, anyways, next week at Wednesday, that's when I'll do that. And um, I see, thank you for being here. That was really helpful. It encourages me to go a little bit deeper on my own when I create the final computer file here. All right, again, thank you so much, everybody. Bye-bye.